Well, praise the Lord and welcome to the broadcast today. I'm your host, Evangelist Carl Brown, and beloved, you're tuned in to Win of the Spirit. And as I always love to say, I'm so delighted that you're tuned in to the program today. Beloved, I'd like to bring to your attention and I'd like to ask for your financial help, your support in keeping Win of the Spirit on the air in your area. I need to tell you that we just had to cancel our hour-long broadcast in Baton Rouge because we did not have the funds to continue that program. But uniquely, beloved, the last night that that program aired, there was a young woman, well, she was a woman that called and prayed the sinner's prayer with us on the air and gave her heart to the Lord. Now this program was airing from two, or three, from two to three o'clock in the morning. And the very last program that aired, she gave her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. She pleaded with us to stay on the air. She did not know that we were airing another half hour program on Sunday morning. So she's going to be tuning in on Sunday morning. But my concern is that whenever we're not on the air, there's always potential for the Holy Spirit to touch somebody's heart and touch somebody's life. And beloved, that's the only reason that we're on television and for no other reason than to preach the gospel that the Holy Spirit can touch hearts and lives. Beloved, you can partner with us. You can help us to continue to reach souls. I want to tell you that every week we get phone calls. At least every other week, someone giving their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some even getting baptized in the Holy Spirit over the telephone. Those of you that are watching me that know this is happening because it has happened to you, I really wish you would tell your friends and neighbors that we could use their support because, beloved, your money is going to good use when you help us to stay on the air. We're reaching souls for the kingdom of God. So if wind of the Spirit has been blessing you on a regular basis and you're learning from the Word of God, beloved, please consider becoming a partner to help us on a monthly basis. Whatever you're able to do on a monthly basis will help us to stay on the air in your area. Well, God bless you, beloved. I know that you're going to help us. Well, beloved, I want to bring to you a special message today, a message regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means. What does it mean to us and what did it mean to those in the time in which Jesus died and was resurrected from the dead and even what it meant to others who were of the Old Testament that died believing that Jesus would come? What did his resurrection actually mean? And for you and I today, beloved, what does it mean for us that Jesus was resurrected from the dead? I'm going to get into this message in just a moment, but I want to ask Sister B.J. B. Vavasor if she would come and minister in song to us today, a very special song regarding the alabaster box of ointment. Beloved, I'll be right back at the end of this song. She made her way to Jesus She stumbles through tears And made her blind She felt such pain Some spoke in anger Heard folks whisper There's no place here for her kind Still on she came tears that flushed her face till at last she knelt before his feet and though she spoke no words everything she said was heard as she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster I've come to 
pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and dry them with my hair. to be I was a prisoner to sin that had me bound I spent my days pouring life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I found until the day when Jesus came to me he healed my soul with the wonder of his touch and now I'm giving back to him all the praise he's worthy of cause I've been forgiven and that's why I love him so much I've come to pour my praise on him like all Well, praise the Lord. Sister B.J. Vavasseur has always been a blessing to us when she comes to help us in this ministry. And the song, you don't know what it costs, beloved. The, 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 what that song is saying, that the woman that broke that alabaster box of ointment over Jesus' feet and poured it over his head was so appreciative of the salvation that he gave to her, that the most expensive thing that she had, she was willing to give it freely to him. And to those of us that have been born again of the Spirit of God, to have the Lord Jesus Christ as our own personal Lord and Savior, we should be willing to give of everything that we have for him also. Beloved, the greatest experience in Carl Brown's life was the day that I accepted Jesus Christ. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I knew 34 years ago, the very moment that he entered into my heart and entered into my life. At an age of 23 years old, the Lord totally changed my life, brought peace, brought joy, and brought a great expectation of the presence of God in my heart. And so I can identify with that woman that broke that alabaster box of ointment and gave it 
to the Lord Jesus Christ in, in commemoration of what he was about to do by going to die on Calvary's cross and to be raised from the dead. Well, beloved, as I said, I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means to us that he was risen from the dead. And beloved, I want to give the account of this, the greatest experience that ever happened in human history that the Lord Jesus Christ would come from the dead and be alive again. I want to give you this account of those that were eyewitnesses, not only to the resurrection, but to the life he lived while he was here on earth. They, they witnessed his crucifixion and they witnessed his resurrection. And beloved, I want to begin in the book of Luke. Now, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but in a minute, we're going to go before the resurrection. But I want to bring to you the statement that Jesus made to his apostles after the resurrection. In the book of Luke, chapter 24, beloved, beginning at verse 44, it says this, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He was saying that his death, burial, and resurrection was what he had told them prior to it happening, but it was prophesied before of Moses and of the prophets of old. And verse 45 says this, beloved, then he opened their understanding that they may understand the scriptures. Now, beloved, many of you that call and ask for prayer say that when we teach the word of God, that your understanding is very clear regarding the word of God. Well, beloved, it's because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Not that I'm such a great teacher. I would never consider taking that type of credit to myself. But I understand that when we're ministering the word of God, the Holy Spirit is moving and helping us to understand the word of God. This is how people call and get saved because the Holy Spirit deals with them. Listen at what Jesus said in verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scripture. So the apostle didn't fully understand about the resurrection. And we're going to see that in just a minute. But after he was raised from the dead, he anointed them that they could see. And now all of a sudden the scriptures came to life in verse 46 and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead. Uh, let me reread that. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48 and you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise upon you, but I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Jesus said to his apostles, and you are witnesses of these things. Beloved, the apostles witnessed the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They witnessed being personally called of him to become the apostles, the 12, the foundation apostles to carry on the work of the ministry. They witnessed the experience of having him move upon them and change their lives. Beloved, they walked away from their jobs. They walked away from their fishing. Uh, they walked away from everything that they were doing in life because of the difference that he made in them. And they witnessed his life as he healed the sick. 
They witnessed him raise the dead. They witnessed him cast out devils. They witnessed the mighty miracle that he performed while he was here on earth. And Jesus said to them, you are my witnesses. And beloved, as they witness his life, as they witness him dying on Calvary's cross, they witnessed the crucifixion. They witnessed him being beaten to death. They witnessed the fact that he had given his life, but they didn't understand prior to him opening their understanding as to why he needed to go through what he went through. So their mindset was that he was going to be with them. But beloved, when he died, when he was crucified on Calvary's cross, it shook them to the core. They did not know what to expect. But beloved, I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it meant to those then and what it means to us today. Beloved, I want to begin now uh, at the reading of the scripture at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is in St. John chapter 20. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 17. Beginning at St. John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now, you remember that after Jesus' crucifixion, after he died and after he was taken down from the cross, men came to, um, to Herod and asked that a stone be placed at the temple, at the gravesite of the tomb of Jesus to seal it to make sure that no one would come and steal his body. But beloved, the Bible says when Mary came to the sepulcher, the stone was taken away. And beloved, that's because in the book of Matthews, the Bible says that there was an earthquake and an angel came down from heaven and removed that stone. And beloved, that was a great and mighty miracle that took place. They did not move that stone so Jesus could come out from the tomb. They moved that stone so that everyone that would come to that tomb would see that he was no longer there. And in verse two, it says, then she, Mary, runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And this was the apostle John who writes this and said unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not, we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher and stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see it, the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, beloved, this typifies that Jesus was risen from the dead. If anybody had come to steal the body, beloved, they wouldn't have taken the time to fold the napkin that was over his head and the garment that was spread over his body. He took time to do that. When he arose from the dead, beloved, he folded those linen clothes and laid them on the side. In verse 8 says, then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Now, beloved, in verse 8, it says, 
Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, he saw and believed. Now he didn't believe on the resurrection yet. He simply believed what Mary Magdalene had said, that Jesus was no longer in the tomb. And she had thought, she thought someone had taken his body and took it somewhere else. So John believed then that the body of Jesus was gone. Not that he was resurrected. And you're going to see that in verse nine. Let me read verse eight again. Then went also, then went in also that other disciple who came first to the sepulcher, he saw and believed for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again the third day. So they wasn't expecting a resurrection. John simply believed what Mary Magdalene had run and told them. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Now, beloved, Mary Magdalene had a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why that song, Sister BJ sung, was so powerful. The alabaster box. Mary Magdalene was a woman that was demon possessed. She had seven demon spirits and Mary Magdalene, before she met Jesus, was a prostitute selling her body. But when she met the King of Kings and when she met the Lord of Lords, for the first time in this woman's life, she knew what love meant. She gave her heart. She gave her soul. She gave her everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why she was standing outside of the tomb weeping because her whole life was wrapped up in the fact that Jesus had changed her, that he had cast out seven devils from her and she did not want to lose his presence. And so it is with every believer that's genuinely born again. We would not know what to do if we couldn't live for the Lord. I know for me, I would not want to live one day in this world without Jesus Christ. And so I can somewhat understand what Mary Magdalene was feeling. So she stood outside after the, the apostles left. She was weeping because she was missing her Lord. In verse 11, it said, but Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see it two angels while sitting. Let me reread that verse 12 and see it two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at his feet. Beloved, this typified the uh, mercy seat in heaven of the cherubim that were in the temple in that tabernacle that represented the presence of God. That mercy seat had an angel on either side cherubims and this typifies that place of the presence of God in that tabernacle. It says and see it two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where Jesus, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, because they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. So she was weeping because she missed her Lord and her savior, Jesus. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, beloved, he was resurrected from the dead and he took on a glorified body. She did not know that this was Jesus. And beloved, keep in mind, when Jesus was on the cross, they beat him unmercifully. That's why Mary couldn't recognize him because he was so marred, the Bible says, in the book of Isaiah. 
His visage, his face was so beat that he looked like an animal when he was on that cross. But praise God, when he raised from, when he was, a, when he rose from the dead, he took on a glorified body. And so when Mary saw him, she did not recognize him. And Jesus said unto her in verse 15, woman, why weepest thou? And then he asked her this, whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener said unto him, sir, if thou have borne him, tell me where thou hast laid him and I will take him away. Mary thought that Jesus was the gardener and she assumed that he had taken the body of Jesus Christ and placed it someone else, somewhere else. And she asked him and said, tell me so I can go and retrieve his body. In verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Mary, this time he didn't call her woman. This time he said, Mary. And beloved, don't you know those that are born again of the spirit of God and saved that he know you by name, glory to God. He know Carl Brown by name, just as he knew Mary Magdalene by name. Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. All of a sudden, the one she loved and the one she thought was dead was now alive. And she clung to him and called him Master. Verse 17, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, ascend unto my fa- I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. He told Mary Magdalene, don't touch me. In all actuality, beloved, Mary had grabbed him around his legs and she was so glad that he was alive and when he was saying don't touch me he wasn't saying don't put your hands on me Mary didn't want to let him go Mary had grabbed him around his leg and was holding on for dear life she felt that she lost him once but she didn't want to lose him again and what Jesus was literally saying to her was Mary I have not yet ascended to my father I have got to go and present my blood on the mercy seat in heaven that the work can be completely finish that sin will be done away with and the child of God can go free. But Mary cling to him and I don't blame her beloved because I remember where I was in life when Jesus came to me and I clung to him 34 years ago and I have not yet let him go. But beloved, remember he said, Mary, now listen, beloved, this was a woman that was demon possessed. The Bible says she was possessed with seven demon spirits. And Jesus cast those spirits out, changed her life. Mary was a a tramp, if you will, before coming to Jesus. And the most holiest moment in all of history, the Son of God, risen from the dead, took time to reveal himself to a woman who was once selling her body as a prostitute, to a woman who was bound by sin, to a woman that was possessed by seven demon spirits. But beloved, Jesus has so touched Mary that her life was changed. He was in a glorified state, but he wanted her to know he loved her. And beloved, I want to let you know, I don't care what you did, 
before you came to Jesus Christ. He don't remember what you did, just like he didn't remember what Mary Magdalene did, just like he showed her just how important she was to him. Beloved, he, you are just as important to him also. He doesn't look at your past failures. He doesn't look at your past sins. If he could stop before he go to heaven and present his blood on the mercy seat of heaven for us and stop and talk to this woman and show her his love, then beloved, he loves you as well. And he wants you to know that he loves you and that he calls you by name. This Lord, this Savior, this Redeemer who is God in the flesh, know us personally, just like he knew Mary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I remember those years when Carl Brown was bound in sin. When I was doing all the stuff that I was doing, I was a sinner and on my way to hell, but he had mercy on me and forgave me of my sins. Hallelujah. So I know how Mary Magdalene felt. But beloved, I want to remind you, Jesus, God in the flesh, the son of almighty God, paid the price for sin. And before he went to heaven, after the greatest event in human history, the most holiest moment, he stopped to say, Mary, I love you. And she clung to him. Beloved, Whatever you did in your life before meeting Jesus, he don't remember it. And he knows you by name. And beloved, just in case you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sins, just in case you think you've gone too far in life for God to forgive you, just in case the devil has lied to you and told you there is no hope, that you can never be saved. You, you may have killed somebody. You may have murdered somebody. You may have had an abortion and murdered a baby. And your, your heart is so torn because of it. You may have gotten into a fight with somebody and you may have killed somebody. But beloved, I want to let you know you have not gone so far down in life that he cannot reach you. He can reach you. The arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. The Bible said, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Just in case, beloved, you don't know Jesus loves you. It makes no difference how far you have gone in sin. He demonstrated that by his death on Calvary for us on the cross. While we was yet sinners, God introduced his love to us that Jesus died on Calvary's cross. He reinforces that by visiting Mary Magdalene, a woman that was possessed of seven. Beloved, think about this. This was a woman demon possessed. Seven spirits had possessed her. If you remember the movie, The Exorcist, if you can remember a movie and that was just a movie, but if you can envision that young girl in that movie being possessed by one demon spirit, Mary Magdalene had seven in her and Jesus set her free and he forgave her of her sin. Is it any wonder, beloved, that she didn't mind breaking that alabaster box of ointment and pouring it over his feet? and wiping his feet with her hair because she was the very reason that he was the very reason that she was alive, that her life had been changed. Beloved, that's why I do what I do. That's why I am what I am because Jesus found me as a sinner and forgave me of all my sin, and I will run until he comes for the purpose of telling others about the goodness of the Lord. Well, beloved, he was resurrected from the dead, the son of almighty God, 
who paid the ultimate price that we could go free. And beloved, why is the resurrection so important? I will tell you this, beloved. I want you to look in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. What did it mean? Why is it so important? Well, beloved, it says here, Paul says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also vain. Paul said, if, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain. And your faith also is vain. And beloved, that is because our sins would still remain upon us if Jesus had not paid the price for those sins. How important is that, beloved? That's why the resurrection is so important. That's why we need to understand what the resurrection meant. When Jesus was nailed on Calvary's cross, beloved, when he paid the ultimate price for sin, he did it at Calvary's cross. And he paid the price for sin with his death. And beloved, in order to prove, listen to me real good when I say this, beloved, in order to prove that he paid the price for sin, he was arisen from the dead. Just like the Bible says, on the third day, he rose again. Beloved, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Had Jesus not accomplished the payment of sin through his death, he would not have been able to raise or rise from the dead. I need you to really focus in on what I'm trying to say here. If Jesus died for sin and he didn't cover all sin, that meant, beloved, he would not have been able to rise from the dead because he still would have not paid for sin. But the fact of the matter is that when he paid for the sin debt, when he rose from the dead, it was confirming, beloved, that all sin had been paid for. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm telling you, I don't care what you've done in life. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what sin you may have committed, beloved. Jesus paid for it at Calvary's cross. And the fact that he rose from the dead, beloved, he could not have risen had those sins had not been paid for. But because he paid for sin, death had no longer hold on him. So he was able to raise or rise from the dead on the third day. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the importance of it, the greatest event in human history without the resurrection, Calvary and what he did at the cross would have been in vain. That's why the apostle Paul said, your faith would have been in vain. And we would have been most miserable because we would still be in our sins. In verse 14, Paul says, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we find and we found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then Christ is, then Christ is not, uh, then, then is, let me read that, reread that again. Verse 16, 
For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Beloved, if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had not risen from the dead, that would have meant that the sin debt was not paid in totality. He paid the debt at Calvary's cross. When he died, he said, it is finished. So beloved, when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he was the sin bearer. He was God's sacrifice. He was the lamb of God who took the sin of the world upon himself and died. Beloved, when he died at Calvary's cross, your sins were paid for. The fact that he rose from the dead proves that the sin debt had been canceled. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most powerful event in human history, literally took place, and no one can deny it. He is alive. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is alive. The Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Beloved, Jesus is alive. He rose the third day. The resurrection was proof that the sin debt had been paid. Beloved, when Jesus died, his body was in that tomb. But Jesus, just like any other human being, when they die, Jesus was not in that tomb. Jesus went down into paradise. He went down into hell, into the prison, and preached to the angels that were in jail. And he also went down into paradise and led captivity captive. And beloved, when he was finished, he came back into his body in that tomb and took on a glorified body and was raised from the dead. And Mary Magdalene, oh, praise the Lord. Mary Magdalene had hope all over again. And beloved, for the child of God today that know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have hope. Not only in this life do we have hope in Christ, but beloved, when you close your eyes, when you die, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you have eternal life. And there is the hope of every child of God. Beloved, we don't wait till we die to find out if we're going to heaven. The Bible says we have eternal life here, now, and we know it. And you know what that does, beloved? It brings peace. I've seen people die. I've seen people die on their deathbeds. I've prayed with people before they die in hospitals. I've visited people in their homes when they die. But the difference in the believer dying and the difference in those that don't know the Lord when they die is peace. I have seen people die that love the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would slip away from this life in peace. They will close their eyes in full assurance of faith that they would, be, they would spend eternity with God. But I've also seen people die not knowing the Lord. And beloved, they die in fear. I'm talking about people that go to church. I'm talking about people that belong to different churches and they were faithful to their church, but they never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they die, beloved, they die in fear because there's an uncertainty 
when you die without Christ. That's why, beloved, you need to make sure that Jesus Christ is your Lord. You need to make sure that you're born again. You see, just like Mary Magdalene, she couldn't phantom living without Jesus. If I knew I had to live in this current system, in this world without Jesus Christ, I'd want to die. Oh, I'm not just saying that because I'm a preacher on television. I'm saying that because I have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to live in this world without knowing him, without knowing that he's in me and I'm in him and that I am his child. Mary Magdalene, seven devils cast out of her. Beloved, I want you to see that because sometimes when we say things as preachers and people don't read their Bibles and don't know for sure that whether or not what was said is real, I want you to hear this, beloved, in Mark chapter 16, verse 9. It says, well, let me read verse 7. It says, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him as he said unto you. This is the account of Mark giving of the resurrection. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher and they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man for they were afraid. Now, when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Listen, beloved, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And, he, and she went and told them that had been with, that she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. He cast out of Mary Magdalene seven devils. And beloved, she loved him. And I want to reiterate, beloved, I don't care what you've done in life. The Bible said this woman was a prostitute. She was demon possessed. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, forgave her of her sins. Now, beloved, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each testify of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion and resurrection. Each book testifies of this. Each one tells what they've seen. Many people say the Bible contradicts itself because they tell different accounts. Well, beloved, the Bible really doesn't contradict itself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were eyewitnesses of what Jesus did, of his death, burial, and of his resurrection. Each one of them literally saw him in his life, in his crucifixion, and in his resurrection. And they told the story as they saw it. They did not contradict what happened, beloved. Some focused in on things that the other did not. Let me give you this illustration, beloved. It's each one of us, if four different people witnessed an accident and each person without talking to the other wrote down what they witnessed, each one would witness something different, but they would all testify that the accident did happen. And that is the difference with the Gospels. It's not that they're contradicting each other. It's just that they're telling what they focused on during what happened. So each one of them told a different scenario, but they all confirmed that Jesus lived, that he died, that he was crucified, and that he rose from the dead. So the Bible doesn't contradict itself, beloved. But these men were eyewitnesses. They didn't believe initially. They didn't understand that Jesus' purpose was to rise from the dead. But they all felt hopeless momentarily until he 
was resurrected from the dead because each one of these men's lives were changed. Not only Mary Magdalene, but all of the apostles' lives were changed. Beloved, they were all saved by faith and they all experienced the Lord changing their heart and life. So when I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what did it mean? Beloved, it means that you don't have to live in your sin that Jesus is alive, that he wants to come into your life just like he did Mary Magdalene. He wants to come into your heart just like he did those apostles. He wants to change your life. He wants to take away your sin and give you righteousness. Beloved, the resurrection is more than a celebration during the Easter time of the season. It is an everyday life of, of effect on the believer that knows the Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection testified that we have new life. His resurrection testified that our past sins are gone forever. And beloved, he stands ready today to forgive you of your sins. If you are bound by sin, beloved, the resurrection of Jesus Christ testifies that he paid the price for your sins. Beloved, face it, nothing can take away sin but the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross and he shed his precious blood, that blood was pure, innocent blood. Jesus was the Lamb of God and he took away the sin of the world and paid for it with his life. His blood cleanses all sin. Beloved, joining church doesn't take away sin. Confessing your sins to a priest doesn't take away sin. Partaking of a wafer and wine is not partaking of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not take away sin. Being baptized in water in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Do not take away sin. Beloved, when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, his life's blood poured out, paid the price for sin. He, his body dying, paid the penalty for that sin. And so, beloved, it's Jesus and what he did are nothing. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Your sins must be forgiven by Jesus and Jesus alone. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You cannot get to God because of your sins. And when Jesus died, he paid the price for your sin. That's why Jesus said, you can't come to the Father unless you come to me. Now, beloved, I want to tell you that he stands ready to forgive you of your sins. He's alive. Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. And he wants to take away your sin. When I witness to people and when I talk to people about being saved, people don't realize that they're putting their faith in their church. The church can't save you, beloved. The church didn't die on Calvary's cross. The church wasn't buried and rose from the, and, and was raised from the dead. Jesus did that. When I talk to people and find out that their faith is not in Jesus Christ, I emphatically let them know that if you die believing in something other than what Jesus did at Calvary's cross, that you will die in your sin and you will go to hell. Now, beloved, I know that that's not popular preaching, but preaching should never be popular. And preachers shouldn't simply preach to make people like them. We are called of God to tell the truth. If you do not, beloved, I want to say this emphatically. If you do not accept Jesus Christ, if you do not believe that he was buried and raised from the dead, 
If you do not confess your sins to him and only him, then beloved, you are in your sin. And if you die, God forbid, but as long as you have breath in your body, you're listening to this evangelist right now, you could very well be on your deathbed. Do not let these words slip by you, beloved. If you are in your sins, if you have put your faith in anything other than what Jesus did, you will die in your sin and you will go to hell. Beloved, God doesn't want that. That's why he sent Jesus Christ for him to take away your sins and pay the penalty for you. Beloved, either you're going to trust Jesus to do it or you're going to have to do it yourself. God forbid that it happens that way. Now, beloved, if you're watching this evangelist right now and you've heard what I said, the importance of the resurrection for us today is that if Jesus not raised, been raised from the dead, we would still be in our sins. But because he's alive, we are forgiven. And beloved, you can ask the Lord right now to forgive you of your sins. But today, the Holy Spirit has brought it home. I stand convicted of my sins and I repent of what I have done. And I ask you to have mercy upon me. I accept Jesus Christ because I believe he was raised from the dead. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, wash me in your precious blood and make me whole. Thank you for receiving me as your child and for forgiving me of my sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, beloved, that's all the time that I have for the program today. If you prayed that prayer or if you want to pray that prayer, give us a call and we'll talk with you over the phone. God bless you, beloved. We'll see you this same time next week on Wind of the Spirit. And from the holy breath of you, here I stand. 